Broadcasting from Boston, Massachusetts, the Smart Cities podcast is the only podcast dedicated to all things smart cities. The podcast is the creation of ARC Advisory Group's Smart City Practice. ARC advises leading companies, municipalities, and governments on technology trends and market dynamics that affect their business and quality of life in their cities. To engage further, please like and share our podcast or reach out directly on Twitter at Smart City Viewpoints or on our website at www.arcweb.com backslash industries backslash smart dash cities. Hello and welcome to another installment of the ARC Smart City Podcast. I'm Larry O'Brien. I'm Vice President of Research at ARC Advisory Group. And today we have a couple of very interesting guests with us. We have Seth Dobrin of IBM. Good morning, Seth. Hey, good morning. We have, uh, good morning. We have Graham McDonald of the Urban Institute. How are you doing, Graham? Doing great. Great to be here, Larry. We were talking a little bit about what are we going to call this episode? Um, it's a little different from what we normally do. Normally, if you tune into our podcast, we talk a lot about technology. We don't talk a lot about the benefit of technology. So today we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to talk about AI, but we're also going to talk about how can we make neighborhoods better? How can we use AI for good? So this is a couple of things um, that I really like to talk about is practical application of AI, which we don't see a lot of, and how can we use that to actually do some good? So why don't we start by introducing you guys? Um, We can start with Seth. Seth, why don't you tell us a little bit about your role at IBM and what you do and how you became involved in this project that we're going to talk more about. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to everyone about this really important topic. So Seth Dobrin, I'm the Global Chief AI Officer here at IBM. Uh, my responsibility is multifold. First and foremost, I'm responsible for defining the AI half of IBM's hybrid cloud and AI strategy across the whole company. So what does that mean for, for IBM? How do we go to market? How do we do communications? And in fact, how do we engage with with folks like the Urban Institute for around AI for good. So how do we bring the power of not just IBM technology, but the people inside IBM who are very passionate about helping uh, non, you know, NGOs implement AI to make themselves better, to make the world a better place. And so that's how we inter- start interacting with Graham and the Urban Institute. Uh, I think it's great that you're doing this partnership, too. These public-private partnerships really produce a lot of interesting results. And, Graham, I'll have you introduce yourself since you're from uh, the Urban Institute. Thanks, Larry. Yeah, my name is um, Graham McDonald, and I'm at the Urban Institute, as you said. Um, my the Urban Institute is a nonprofit, nonpartisan uh, research organization, and our goal is to elevate the debate. So what we try to do is provide evidence, data, into the public debate to help folks make better decisions and to improve the outcomes for communities, um, government, and what we call change makers, who could be folks from the corporate sector, from the government sector, individual citizens, advocates trying to make change, and hopefully hopefully making that debate a little bit more evidence-based. And my team, uh, I lead the data science team and a technology and data science team here at the Urban Institute, and we really try to take the leading edge technologies and to use that in our data in our data systems to help to drive that change. And so we often rely on folks like uh, uh, Seth and, and the great people at IBM who are really at the cutting edge of this work to help us to drive uh, even further into that domain. So really excited to, to be here and to be here with Seth to talk about this project. Yeah, we're glad to have both of you. Uh, so Seth, maybe you can explain a little bit about uh, what this project is and how we're using this uh, artificial intelligence technology to to produce better results in neighborhoods and make lives better for people, right? Uh, we When we talk about smart cities at ARC, we, we usually talk about the benefits to certain groups of people, right? There's economic benefits, there's uh, social benefits, there's environmental benefits. Uh, you know, I usually find um, whatever benefits the citizens and the people usually provides a lot of other benefits too. Um, but let's talk a little bit about how how we're using technology in this case to to help you know drive better results and make lives better for people. Yeah, so maybe I'll talk about the technology and and kind of how we're approaching this, and let Graham talk about the outcome since he's he's closer to mm-hmm. it. So, you know, I I think um, it's important to remember a couple things. So first, and and you know, it's important to remember that a lot of nonprofits, in fact, most nonprofits, don't have access to the same resources. Uh, and people that for-profit companies often do. 
Uh, so it's harder for them to attract talent uh, because they don't pay as much while they may be working on something that's socially good. And there are people that will give up some some salary like Graham to, in order to work on things that are going to benefit society overall. Um, you know, how can we as companies better engage with these nonprofits to help fill that gap so that Graham can have help? Folks like Graham can have help in executing projects because he can't do it on his own. And equally as important is how do we provide access to the tools and technologies that are required to not only build AI, but operationalize and productionize AI models? Because it's one thing to build a model. It's another thing to put it into production and govern it appropriately. And so bringing tools like and technologies like that to bear here. Plus, in today's world, and especially when we start looking at things like, you know, how do we help the Urban Institute better manage uh, gentrification in, in the communities, how do we ensure that it's done in a trustworthy manner? So how do we ensure that there's, you know, there's fair, it's fair, so, f- you know, free of specific type of biases, or in this case, how do we help them identify specific types of biases? How do we make the models transparent? How do we make them robust? And how do we ensure that we're preserving the privacy of people uh, that are being impacted by these models? What we did was we brought our tool, so our cloud pack for data with Watson Studio, uh, to the Urban Institute, along with some folks from the data science and AI elite team to work on this problem that I'll let Graham uh, get into now. Yeah, Graham, tell us a little bit about the problem here. We're, I know we're talking about gentrification. Um, I think most people probably have some idea what that means. I know I, was, I witnessed it uh, personally living in Austin, Texas uh, for several years. Oh, yeah. um, definitely saw that happening there. So, So tell us about your side of this. Sure. So, you know, although we're called the Urban Institute, we study every single place, rural and urban in the U.S., but we have a special focus in many of our projects on cities. And so we've, this is an issue we've been studying for a long time. And, you know, this is a, the, the, the upward pressure on, on rents and uh, folks who have more resources in neighborhoods is often what we refer to as uh, gentrification. And, and the results of gentrification that we're usually most interested in um, mitigating are those where the folks who have lived there for a long time, we've called the neighborhood their home, but for whatever reason, maybe they're retirees and can't afford the rapidly increasing property taxes, or maybe they're folks mm-hmm. who you know, have a strong family network there and rent there, but the rents are just rising too rapidly, but they need that childcare, right, to stay in that neighborhood and get those resources for, op- for their opportunities to jobs that are nearby or whatever that may be. We wanna preserve that. We wanna ensure that everyone has access to those types of resources in neighborhoods because then we thrive as a country when we all have uh, access to those resources. Um, similarly, we're also focused here on what I would call entry gentrification a little bit uh, as well, Larry, which is the other side of that coin. You know, the, the folks like us and, and like the Department of Housing and Urban Development and local governments and as well as state governments are very interested in preventing the decline because we're not only talking about, you know, really hot cities, like you said, in Austin, but we're also concerned about Rust Belt cities that, um, where neighborhoods have less opportunity, and we want to make sure that there is some um, intervention to ensure that those folks also have access to opportunity as well. So, we're, you know, when we're talking about what the there there is, it's to try to understand what is happening to these neighborhoods in real time, and to make a difference, to, to intervene, to somehow um, uh, to tip the scale so that the, there is equitable growth, because we know that all people have access to opportunities, people do better. Uh, and so the, the real core of this project is we don't know where that's happening right now. And that's our that's, that's the big puzzle piece we tried to solve. Yeah, you can't control what you can't measure, right? So how are we using AI to measure this and, and what are we measuring? And, you know, how, how does this all how does this whole thing work? Uh, can we talk a little bit about that? Sure. So I'll talk a little bit about the measures and uh, <laughs> Seth's more the expert uh, on the AI. Yeah, side, I, I think it's interesting, too, that you're bringing up, you know, this isn't just about anti-gentrification. This is about, you know, giving people access to resources so they can stay where they are and be successful in their communities long term. Right. And, and that's not right, get and pushed out, whether that's gentrification or whether that's because, like you said, you live in a Rust Belt town or, you know, coming from Texas or driving through Colorado. There's tons of little towns, you know, that are struggling. Um, so those people need help too. So I think that's a good way to balance it out. That's right. And that's actually, that's the problem that the Department of Housing and Urban Development originally approached us with. And we were talking with them and, and where we started experimenting on this AI journey with them was, is there, you know, we have data right now that is anywhere from two to seven years old on neighborhood change and where this, where this, which neighborhoods this is occurring. Right. And 
uh, the problem is we want to know where it is now, <laughs> right? Yeah, if we yeah. want to make a difference, we can't say, oh, yeah, that's great. It was that way five years ago. But as we all know, you know, as you said, Larry, living in Austin, but I, I can see here living in D.C. or whatever city you live in. There's a, we can all say point to neighborhoods where they've changed massively in the last few years. And then we put COVID on top of it where, you know, the most recent data is from before COVID that we have right now. And now we're talking about housing markets that have been abandoned as a result of COVID. Uh, and we're trying to figure out, well, where do we intervene now? Not where do we intervene two years ago is the government policy response. So we initially worked with HUD to sort of define uh, what, and HUD is my acronym, uh, my DC acronym coming out, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, yep. um, to define neighborhoods that were gentrifying, declining, uh, inclusively growing, which is what we like, or unchanging. They they just, you know, there wasn't a ton of change happening. And the vast majority of neighborhoods happen to be in the unchanging or inclusively growing category. And there are a small number of neighborhoods that are in the declining and gentrifying category. And what we were trying to do was um, define those neighborhoods and then use machine learning, taking the old data that we have to project or predict in real time what is happening right now. Uh, and that's where okay. the AI came in. Uh, we had done a lot of that work, uh, a lot of work with HUD to, to get a model where we wanted, where, where, where it could be, you know, accurate at what we were doing. But actually what we found out through this process, which is really fascinating, is that accuracy was almost not very important at all in this project. <laughs> and the two most important things were, you know, precision, uh, which is the, 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 the relative accuracy with which um, the correct ones were predicted, which matters because that's where government cares about spending its money. They want to spend the money in the most efficient way possible. And the second was, we were real great and we did really well at predicting unchanging and inclusively growing neighborhoods, but we did a terrible job uh, in predicting the uh, declining and gentrifying neighborhoods, which are the ones we care most about intervening in. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, so we had to work attention. with the uh, IBM team to sort of construct different measures of success in this project. And so the technology was both about getting a better AI model and about how we better define it to meet the goals that we want to meet in this project. Well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about the model and uh, and how we develop those goals to, you know, to arrive at an outcome. Uh, Seth, you want to comment on that? Yeah, I also want to jump back really to, to something that Graham mentioned. And since you said this is usually a more technical podcast, maybe maybe I'll dig a little deeper. So Graham was talking about the metrics that we were using to measure the model performance. And and oftentimes we think about accuracy. And, and if you think about what accuracy is, it's did I hit the bullseye? Uh, and 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 not necessarily did I hit the bullseye every time, but did I have the, hit the bullseye? Precision looks at what is the grouping. So are we precise? So is every time are we are the are the darts going in the same spot or about the same spot, regardless of if they're if they're accurate? And and in a case like this where accuracy is less important, we want to make sure you measure predictive positive, you know, the predictive ability. Uh, or the precision rather, um, because it's easy easier to move a cluster to be more accurate than it is to tighten up a, 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 a dispersion around some some level of accuracy. Um, and, and and so I guess the point is the metric is not always am I accurate. The metric is use case by use case, and need, you need to have a thoughtful design of what your metrics going to be. There also needs to be some mis business metric that's associated with it, and that's some of the things that that Graham that Graham talked about. Um, okay. Can I jump and, in real quick there, Seth? Do you mind? Yeah. Uh, well, I'll, I'll say if in this case, I'll define precision. In the, the way the government defines precision working with HUD is great. It's are we most efficient with our money, which is different than you can be very accurate, and but you'll have to spend a trillion dollars to get to all the <laughs> the gentrifying neighborhoods. What they care about is. How can we spend less money and still hit the same number of neighborhoods? And that's when we increasing the precision with Seth's team was really key is we're making these models more efficient in the way that we target and spend that money. And that's much more important to them than whether we move a point in accuracy. OK, we're getting a little introduction to data science here, I feel. Yeah, uh, yeah which and, is good. And actually, it's, it's interesting. Sometimes we go in and help customers, whether they're nonprofits like the Urban Institute or others, and we solve the, help them solve the wrong problem. So so in this mm -hmm. case, we could have helped mm -hmm. them solve how to spend a trillion dollars and help one neighborhood. Right. But we actually did a good job defining the, the outcome up front. And so you, you can solve the wrong problem using the tools of data science and AI if you don't do a good job up front. 
That's a good point. Uh, and I think it's something everybody should take away from this podcast. Uh, so let's talk about how you're doing it. So how, how does this play out on the ground? We're measuring, you know, different variables in different neighborhoods and putting that into a model, I assume, and trying to use that model to predict is this neighborhood headed in the right direction? Yeah. So, so, so I think, you know, a- AI doesn't happen in a vacuum or data science doesn't happen in a vacuum. In order to do that, you need, you need data. And, and Graham mentioned about about the data, and we have pretty extensive data going back a few years. Uh, we have less data more recently. COVID kind of made the data that did exist pre-COVID some somewhat um, irrelevant. Maybe irrelevant is not the right word, but but less. Well, less I think it's yeah. Probably. I think it's probably a pretty good word because everything's yeah. totally less, different. Less, in, less informative is probably a better word because it didn't yeah. completely throw away everything. Um, but it but it changed the game. It was it was an outlier, right? Um, a, a couple of outlier years, um, but it's the world we live in now, the impacts of, of COVID. And so, you know, how do you take that data uh, and how do you leverage it in order to make predictions? And so, you know, there, there's the, the, this, in this case, the, the group looked at eight metropolitan areas um, along the East Coast and Central U.S. Um, and we analyzed, they, they analyzed this data using census, census tract level. Uh, and, and so, you know, we, we also pulled in additional data uh, to help. So Zillow Home Value Index and, and Rent Index data was used. Uh, there's a Housing Choice Voucher, voucher Program that's available in the public. Um, and, and then there are other data sets that can be pulled in uh, that show, uh, you know, that can kind of help influence us. So, so the point is, it's it's not one data set, and it's not necessarily only data that an entity or a company uh, has ownership of. There's lots of public data out there. Oh yeah. And lots of third party data that can help you fill in gaps um, around what's going on. Uh, so for instance, the Zillow data very much informed the changes that were happening due to COVID uh, in this case, because they were more real time or more uh, more up to date than than the data that the government provided to the Urban Institute. Yeah. And I think that's something that we've as an analyst covering the smart city space, I see that a lot. There's a lot of data from a lot of different sources. Um, I cover smart city platforms. A lot of my previous podcasts have been kind of around that smart city platform topic, which does tend to get kind of technical. And we end up talking about things like we need to take this data from all these different sources, you know, whether it's publicly available government data or like you said, Zillow, you know, kind of data. There's a lot of different data sources out there. And the government doesn't provide real-time data, right? I mean, all the data you're getting from the government is going to be a year old, two years old. So that, you know, and, and they provide great data. I mean, I go to government data all the time, you know, when I'm doing research, but that it's that dynamic real-time aspect of it. And with COVID and climate change and everything else, things are, are changing a lot faster in the urban landscape or, or within, you know, even rural cities and, and communities. Things are just changing faster. One of the ways I put it was it feels like everything is happening at once because it is, right? You've got COVID and supply chain problems and climate related issues and things like that. So we're taking this data from all these different sources and combining it together to form a common model. I'm not sure how deep you want to get into that, but I assume you have, you know, you have this common data model uh, that you've put together. Can we talk a little bit about that in, in layman's terms that our listeners can understand or? Yes. So Graham, I'll let you take, take that one. Sure. That sounds great. Yeah. So I, the, essentially what we're doing is we are taking the ground truth data that the government provides, right? So we're taking the American Community Survey data, the most recent we have, and we are using that data as the base, right? So we, we recognize that that's what governments, that's what local activists, that's what folks are using now to determine neighborhood change. They're saying, I'm looking at the average, and in this case, because we're looking at the neighborhood level and because the census combines years, we're talking about an average from 2015 to 2019 of the American Community Survey that currently serves as what is happening in 2021, <laughs> right? So that's that's how we start, and that because that's what people are using. And that's our baseline we use to measure our progress. And then we say, let's take all these other sources that Seth described. Let's take Zillow. Let's take out the common uh, the housing choice vouchers from today. Let's take you know Home Mortgage Disclosure Act data. Let's take whatever data that we have available and that has more recency to it, and let's use that using from the gold standard to predict what is happening now. Um, and uh, we basically can back test it. We can use previous years of data, knowing 
the later years of data gold standard, so we can use 2012 to predict 2016 or something like that, right, to see how accurate our model performed in the past and use that as a benchmark for the future. So basically, we're taking this, you know, gold standard data using some of the more real-time data sources and uh, predicting or, or, or fast-forwarding to, the, to the, the present day. And I think one thing to, to, to note, and I think was really interesting, and it was a benefit of coming out of the partnership with IBM, not only defining you know, the best way to do this in terms of weighting our metrics so we actually got uh, gentrification and decline neighborhoods right, which we did, which I thought was awesome, because we didn't do in our HUD partnership. Yeah, that is and, awesome. And getting and massively improving our precision or the efficiency that with which government funds could be spent, which I think is um, number two. But number three is we actually didn't end up with a common model. We actually ended up with city level models at the end of the day. Because what we found was that a common model did well, but city models did better. And there are just factors that are different about every city, which any longtime resident of a city will tell you. <laughs> but as a data scientist, yeah. we always want a model that describes it all, right? One model to rule them all. And in here, and what happened was we ended up focusing on these individual level models. And that has two benefits. One is we were able to focus on city level factors and make them, make them more accurate for each city. Um, but the second is that um, and I, you know, Seth will probably share this later. Is we ended up sharing the code and, our, and and the cloud pack online, along with our white paper and cheat sheet and things like that. And we have partners in these local cities that we hope in the future will be taking that data that we added to the model and adding their local data set to it, right? Their local knowledge and being able to use that to make this more accurate for their city or their you know local council people, which is we, what we hope is will happen in the future. With this, is that you know. A, we're more accurate by looking at a city level, but B, we, 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 we enable ourselves to, by open sourcing this information, to help those local actors who are good with data add their perspective, which, you know, as we all know, we all know stuff about cities that isn't described in these data sets that we can, that we can, that we, sure. that can tell a story and help us to predict neighborhood change better. Yeah, and, and, and I think, you know, there's, there's a few underlying points in there that are good to pull out. So, so one is that we need to look at what, again, what problem we're trying to solve. And it's not uncommon that we go in the, you know, the data science elite team or IBM consulting will go in to try and help a customer and they're trying to solve this big problem. Uh, so in this case, housing, and they're trying to solve it kind of globally, you know, globally meaning not on a, on a granular scale. We see the same thing. We went in with an insurance company. They were trying to do stuff with Medicare and they were trying to predict what Medicare claims are going to get rejected for the U.S. And really you need to look state by state because every state has their own way of doing Medicare, their only Medicaid, their own requirements. And so you need to look, you need to actually build 50 models in that case, right? In the case of, because every everyone's different and they had been trying for years to build one model and it, it just doesn't work. Similar thing happened here where, you know, the Urban Institute was trying to solve this big problem and the data science and AI elite team helped Graham and, and the data scientists at the Urban Institute focus down and say, look, the problem is really at the community level, right, or at the city level, and building a model that solved that, and building a, a, a pipeline of data. So, you know, the features, what we call features, which are the data elements that go into it. The way this project helps accelerate that is it's the same type of data, the same features or data elements that are brought together or transformed, and you're creating a data pipeline that you can now bring information from a specific city in to feed the model for that specific community or that specific city. So it helps accelerate it. And that's the, the cookbook, if you will, or the set of Jupyter notebooks, which are the, the, the basically the code, the home of the code that's documented. Now, anyone can take that for any community, pick it up, insert their data, build the right features and have the model get trained off of those so that it delivers a good outcome for them. Um, and so we also need to remember that the outputs of these are probabilistic, not deterministic, meaning that it's going to give you a likelihood. It's not going to give you the answer. It's going to say it's going to give you a th this is likely to happen. This is and we see that with yeah. elections. Right. So we see election predictions. Uh -huh. Right. Nate Silver is this great data scientist who predicts elections. Mm -hmm. But even if it's 90 percent accurate, he's still going to be wrong 10 percent of the time. Right. And so understanding that. AI is a prediction and a prediction is probabilistic, not deterministic. So we're not determining the answer. We're telling you the answer. Is, this is the answer that's likely to happen. Um, and that's that that provides, you know, probabilistic in this case is probably a better thing because now it's going to provide the city planners, 
the, the, the nonprofits that are involved in the communities, a set of possible outcomes that they can then look at and put in context of their community. You know, here, here are the five things that you should be looking at if you're trying to manage, you know, community change in Austin. And now the city leaders mm-hmm. and the community leaders in Austin can go in there and say, well, you know what? This one's at the top really doesn't make sense for us right now. And so let's let's have the humans get involved and determine, you know, the, the, the second best and the third best ones are really the ones that we think are going to help the levers that we need to pull to make this a better place. And so having the humans in the loop, getting helping them then reduce the, the near infinite possibilities down to something that a human brain can get their head around is really the value of something like what we've built with with the, the urban institute here yeah i mean you're enabling humans to make better decisions and at the root i think that's what a lot of this is about we're enabling people to make better decisions we're not we're not just relying on the technology to make the decisions for us yeah um, and, and 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 you know ai the value of ai is to augment human intelligence not necessarily yeah, replace it. yeah and i think that's a great point to bring out in this podcast Uh, Thank you for doing that. Um, I do want to talk about resources later because you mentioned open source and and people can take this technology and use it in their own communities. But let's talk first about outcomes. Um, So we've talked a little bit about uh, data sources and and building models and, you know, how can we drive good results by having the human in the loop? But what are some of the results? What, What are some of the outcomes that you're seeing right now with this project? Yeah, so as I mentioned, as I mentioned, I think you know this is something we released a couple months ago, three months ago. So I think we're still working with folks in the field on this one. Uh, But I think it's very promising, right? I think you know we talked to some people who are very interested. Local, we have uh, you know local data intermediaries that are in cities across the country. Not surprisingly, uh, as an urban institute, we have a a vested interest in knowing what's going on uh, with our data people in different cities uh, that are very interested and have been using a lot of different. pieces of our work throughout the pandemic to try to get a better sense of what's going on real time. Because what we hear in the field is everyone wants real time data right now. Every government entity, mm-hmm. every local data player, we want real time data. That's great. You have something before COVID. That'll be a good uh, story we can tell to our kids one day. Right. But uh, right now we want to know how we can improve the situation because things are dynamically changing in real time. And I think there, if there's one thing this pandemic has shown us, it's that um, there's a we we didn't have good real time data systems before, especially in the oh, public no. sector. And you know there is a ton of demand for this. We have been at Urban advising state, local, federal governments on this uh, you know on this issue on uh, because our goal is to elevate the debate is to provide better data. And often our answer is we don't have it. But things like this, uh, you know, solutions like this are very promising, and people are really interested in taking it to the next level. What we've had to work through though is as Seth said in the beginning, we. You know, there's not a lot of data capacity in our sector, right? You know, federal government, big big city governments, maybe big state governments have some data analysts, but even then, you'd be surprised <laughs> that there aren't as many that can sort of take this and run as much as they can, as much as we'd like them to. So we've been very focused on our data intermediaries. These are folks who are, you know, university partners or city partners who are really data savvy across cities, and they are the ones who are most, I think, able and interested in taking this. You know, and tweaking it to their local needs and then helping their local folks to understand what's going on, as well as we're directly engaging with folks at the federal level, like I mentioned with HUD, but also with other federal agencies on ways in which they can just think better about the data infrastructure that they currently have and how that might play into machine learning or AI in the future. Um, Because some of them are at that stage and others are just at the very beginning of their data maturity level Mm -hmm. and really need uh, folks to to help them move along that, that ladder. So, you know, right now we are really we're really excited about the excitement that's out there about helping people to to adopt this. We haven't obviously seen the effects of this going uh, going forward yet because it's only been uh, three months old. So uh, looking forward to seeing what they are. I think that the, the demand for this real time data is is almost infinite at the moment. Yeah, d- data is a huge problem for for governments in general, right? Look look in the U.S. right during COVID, there there is no standard. That's, you know, for, for COVID data, for health, health, public health data. Every state had their own way of collecting data, the own, their own data sets that they collected. So not every state collected the same data. There were, you know, disparities in what was reported and how it was reported. Right. Uh, and even looking at the CDC, CDC data during the COVID was typically at best seven days out date, if not more. WHO data was even even more outdated. And so we have government officials that are making decisions on 
data that they, you know, should be, you know, we want it to be, you know, within a, within a day, let alone, you know, you know, we're, we're talking about weeks that they're making their decision, you know, making decisions and, and actions on. And, and I think we're lucky in the housing area. It's a little bit more standardized in this case because HUD has done a good job of, of you know, saying, OK, if you want to participate in, in these kinds of loan programs or these kinds of access programs, you need to mm-hmm. report this data and, and you need to report it in this way. So they've done a really good job. But I think government j- data and, 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 and it's not just in the U.S., we need to do a better job of enabling governments uh, and municipalities to collect better data so that we can make better decisions just across the board. Yeah, I agree. And, and COVID was really the catalyst for all of this. Uh, there, there wasn't much real time data at all. Uh, no, the only and, the only real time data was coming from us and Johns Hopkins. We had 50 people working literally 24 hours around the clock trying to pull data together for COVID. Johns Hopkins had a similar level of, of activity yeah. around it. Um, so, you know, and, and these are 50 highly skilled people that that's what they were doing literally 24 hours a day around, you know, around the clock. Yep. And I witnessed a lot of cities and communities feverishly try to put together, you know, Power BI based data dashboards and trying to kludge everything together themselves. Or, you know, as I was pushing, you know, maybe invest in a smart city platform that allows you to take all this data from different sources and combine it together into a unified environment. Um but then you have that trick of visualization, right? And and how do you look at the data and how do you make those decisions about the data? I think it's important to talk about the work process aspect of that. Like you mentioned, Graham, you have these data intermediaries on the ground um, that can actually take this data and start to drive some decision making, you know, maybe public policy changing and, you know, actually closing, you know, the humans that are going to close the loop on this. Um I think is a pretty common problem for a lot of people that are going to implement this technology, right? It's one thing to put a model together and get the data, you know, sucking into the model and, you know, and actually look at the data, but then making that closing the loop and making that decision, what are we going to do with this is, is always a problem. So, so the, the, manufacturing, I covered manufacturing for 25 years and they still have that problem, you know? Yeah, there's a few aspects to that. So one is if you're trying to automate a process or workflow, you don't really need to worry about the visualization. You just plug it into that process or workflow. However, if you're, you know, you're you're building a new kind of capability or new way of interacting, you need some design involved in that. You need some storytelling ability. In fact, when I when I initially built the data science elite team, I had a, a new a new skill set that people are like, what is this? I, you know, I, I started hiring data journalists. So think, you know, the people that build the story, the data stories in New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, mm-hmm. 538. But, you know, providing a story around the business outcome that's desired, the data that was used and the model that was built such that it elevates the insights in the language that the business is used to using, using visual tools and visual storytelling capabilities and sometimes just textual. So sometimes you know, it's data journalism. So it's actually telling a story with with data. And that's really important. And that came out, you know, comes out here with the Urban Institute in terms of, you know, how are they surfacing this information to people that have no more than likely have no technical capability, don't even really understand necessarily the data, certainly are likely to not understand, you know, what a random forest or gradient boost model is. Right. Or what, you know, what 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 an F1 metric is, F1 score is. Right. Uh, and, and so how do, how do you take that information and give them something meaningful? Yeah. And I'll, yeah. I want to jump in there really quick because I we those are all things that we do a lot at Urban. And I could talk a, a, a while about this. But what I want to uh, appreciate about the IBM process is and what we appreciate about as an as a nonprofit is we're never going to be the expert on any one of the <laughs> machine learning methodologies that Seth just mentioned or on the right metrics or, or things like that. We have really great data scientists, but we're never going to be at the very leading edge of anything. We like to adopt <laughs> things that maybe Seth's team <laughs> has built, right? Um, or others have built in the open source community and, and, and apply it because we know our audiences and we know how the tech, we know the technology and we can sort of make that interchange work. So what I think works, what was really great about this project is, you know, the the IBM Data Science Elite team started and showed us some of these resources where you can go with an auto ML solution, right? So essentially the idea is you start with a, a tool that helps you do all the fancy choosing of a model and what the best 
uh, model is for the metric you're trying to optimize and picks that for you, right? Which previously takes a ton of time and expertise to do. Uh, and we don't really have many of those people on our staff to say, oh yeah, this is, for this particular problem, you really need to do the regularized XG boost, but of course, you know, no, we don't have any of that, right? So, you know, it, you just have this auto tool that says, okay, here's the most accurate model. Now we're, now we can focus on the metrics and the communication, right? And those are really the most right. important parts of the problem. We don't want to as a profit hire a really expensive data scientist help us figure out the other part we can't first of all but it, it really help, it really opens us up to do the things we're actually good at which is like okay we understand the policymaker is saying i want to optimize government resources and i want to focus on these neighborhoods okay so we need other metrics right so we'll work with the team on that and we really know how to visualize and communicate to folks through our you know our data business storytelling teams but also through uh, our contacts we have tons of contacts the local government we understand how to talk to them right and so let's do what we're good at and not what we're you know what yeah, is not yeah. our specialty right and what, what graham just described is a, using ai to help accelerate and and you know a little bit more democratize the process of building ai um and and so that's that's a really great uh, use of, of of ai is to help provide you know, re, you know, resources in terms of the ability, kind of what Graham described. But even if there's places that have a lot of data scientists, how do you get more capacity out of them? How do you let them focus on the things that are bespoke to their business uh, as opposed to fo focusing on things that are essentially commodity? And that's what this auto AI tool that uh, inside Watson Studio that Graham described, that's what it does. Yeah, I always thought that was one of the great promises of AI in these types of applications is to let people do what they do best. You know, uh, we're not trying to make data scientists out of everybody. Uh, just just let them do their jobs better uh, using this valuable information. So I, we're totally on board with that. Um, AI for good, right? That's the tagline for this podcast. Uh, AI for good. Um, can you talk about some resources? So we talked about open source and other people can use this data. Uh, where do people go to find out more about what you guys are doing? Um, and where would they go, you know, if they are interested, um, in using, uh, this open source, uh, model and, and, uh, information and so forth, where, where do we go? Um, yeah, so we have a, a repository. So we have this in a GitHub repository that's public that anyone can get access to. And as I mentioned, it's in the form of a set of Jupyter notebooks, um, that, um, that, you know, people can insert their own, own data into. Uh, as I described, uh, we can provide the, the exact link um, um, to you, uh, but we do have a white paper that's coming out on this as well that describes all of this uh, in order to, uh, or we do have a white paper, it's not coming out, it is out. Uh, and you can actually just Google IBM Urban Institute and, and it'll be the, the first hit that comes up. That's probably the easiest way for me okay. to, to point people to it. Um, and then, um, you know, uh, if people want to learn more about it and they want to they start using it. I'm sure, you know, I'll volunteer Graham and myself reach out to us and we'll we'll make sure that, you know, you you can uh, you can have access to the, the the right resources and, you know, dig a little deeper if you want. Yeah, and I'll add a couple of things to that. One of which is we have uh, for, on our end, we've written a blog post sort of detailing the policy background and, and the initial efforts we have in HUD and then how that, that evolved into these efforts with IBM. Uh, and then I'll also say one of the things that we worked with the IBM team on, which I thought was really cool, was. You know, obviously putting in GitHub and making it open source was great, but there's also a starter kit in the IBM Cloud Pack for data. So if you just want to, you don't want to worry about setting up your own resources or figuring out how to, you know, install all the right libraries in Python or whatever it may be. You, there's just like a pretty easy, quick start there for people who want to be able to you know, get up and running on the model really quick. And that was one of the things I really appreciated about the team is they really wanted to you know, make this really easily, easily available. Yeah, thanks for doing the marketing plug for me, Graham. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was, I thought it was a good idea, you know? Yeah, I thought you know, it was it, cool. It's yeah, a win-win. So we, win. have the, we build accelerators of all kinds into our products, and this is just another another one that's for, for social good. And, and the Urban Institute is not the only AI for social good project that we have going. We have, you know, a half a dozen going at, at any one time. And, you know, we, we I think one of the things that differentiates us as well, as I said at the beginning, is not only do we provide technology to them, uh, you know, uh, free for a little while and, and, and at cost in perpetuity or close to at cost. We also provide people to help them deliver projects, to help them get real value, to show them how you can use, you know, a combination of proprietary and open source tools 
to actually execute these projects and get extra capacity. Um, and, and, you know, that's this whole AI for social good uh, program that we rerun at IBM. And, you know, we have, uh, I don't know, we have like, uh, you know, 250,000 people at IBM now, most of which are very passionate about some form of, of community service, doing good for communities that they live in. Uh, and when we when we reach out for volunteers, usually in minutes, we already have too many. Uh, and so, That's you know, good. not even talking about IBM products, but talking about just the IBMers in general that are so passionate about helping the communities they live in and making, you know, society a, a better place for for everyone and making it inclusive for everyone. And I think that's a that's a that's something I'd like to point out. I think it's definitely worth pointing out. Thank you for doing that. Um, so if you want to find out more, just Google IBM and Urban Institute and you will find out a lot more. I, I just did that myself and a bunch of IBM links and Urban Institute stuff came up. So that does work. And if you want to find out more, I, I can pass information on. You can email me at lobrien, L-O-B-R-I-E-N, at arcweb.com, A-R-C-W-E-B.com, if you want to email me and find out more. Uh, I'd be happy to help our listeners out out there. And, of course, if you want to find out more about ARC, you can go to www.arcwebarcweb.com. But we are just about out of time today, guys. Uh, is there anything else we want to add before we wrap things up here? might be good to do a follow-up on this a few months from now, see how this is working out on the ground and what kind of results we're getting. Yeah, I'd be interested to hear from Graham how, how you know communities are using this and, and how we're, they're getting value from it. So for sure, we'll, we're happy to do I'm happy to yeah. do a follow-up to hear Graham talk. <laughs> I appreciate it. Can I make my uh, my field building plug here, Larry? To, yeah, to sure. Go ahead. Right? Yeah. All right. So the, everyone I was on my team will now will turn this off if they're listening, but um, <laughs> they've heard this too many times. But you know, I'm I'm really passionate about this field of 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 AI and data science for social good, and you know, I think there's so many ways to get involved. Whether it's as Seth said, you know, I, IBMers, you know raising their hands and volunteering, folks working at the Urban Institute, folks who are civic data scientists in their communities. And I'm just really passionate about building up those skills and, and capabilities and would encourage people to follow along and get involved in either this project or other projects that the AI for Good or our team here at the Urban Institute has done and take a look at them and take a look at the code uh, and, and and get involved in this field because we need more, as Seth said in the beginning, and I agree with it completely, we need more folks who are focused on how do we apply this amazing technology and and have it benefit society in general and benefit NGOs or governments or other organizations? Because we really need those folks. We really need you <laughs> to get involved. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, just build on that a little bit. I, I often get asked, you know, I want to be a data scientist. How do I do that? You know, and I've taken this this MOOC or that MOOC, you know, this online course or that online course and gotten the certification. My response to them is, you know, you need to actually do projects. And many of these people are skilled either in statistics or coding, and they just want to kind of bring those together. And, and I tell them, find something you're passionate about and and get the data and, and pull it together and do a project. One thing that I'm going to start saying, you know, that I started saying over the course of last year is reach out to your favorite nonprofit. They are probably looking for people to help them. Um, and you can help them with what you've learned and what you already know to actually execute projects and put what you've learned through these classes to work. And that's really when you learn it. And so, you know, I encourage people who want to get into the field of data science or AI, like I just said, reach out to the Urban Institute, reach out to Diaper Bank, reach out to, you know, whatever your favorite nonprofit is and see if there's the help that they need in this space, because I bet there is. That's great advice, Seth. Thank you. We definitely do need more people and we do need more people to volunteer for stuff like this. I know, you know, growing up in my family, we we're always very service oriented and did a lot of community service stuff. So um, it's good to hear that this is going on. You know, this is a, a lot. It's a refreshing change for this podcast <laughs> that we're actually talking about stuff like this. And we're talking about technology at the same time. Now, usually we talk about the economic benefits or, you know, things like that. But uh, this has been a great discussion. I want to thank you guys for joining me today. Again, we're talking to Seth Dobrin and, and uh, Graham McDonald. Seth is with IBM and Graham is with the Urban Institute. And hopefully we'll be doing this again in a few months to, to track how this project is going. But I want to thank you for joining us on this latest edition of the ARC Smart City Podcast. And we will see you next time. Thanks. 
Broadcasting from Boston, Massachusetts, the Smart Cities podcast is the only podcast dedicated to all things smart cities. The podcast is the creation of ARC Advisory Group's Smart City Practice. ARC advises leading companies, municipalities, and governments on technology trends and market dynamics that affect their business and quality of life in their cities. To engage further, please like and share our podcast or reach out directly on Twitter at Smart City Viewpoints or on our website at www.arcweb.com backslash industries backslash smart dash cities.